Businesses are transforming at record speeds and connecting centers of data is fundamental to success. Gartner recently said that businesses are three times more likely to fail in their digital transformation initiatives if they don't transform the network first. I'm Emily Wong and I've brought together some brilliant colleagues for a discussion on the future of data centers. Gentlemen, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm Mansur Karam, uh, previously founder and CEO of Appstra, currently VP Products at Juniper. And my name is Nick Davey, I'm the product lead for Contrail Networking here at Juniper. Uh, Scott Snedden, I lead the data center specialist team at Juniper Networks. Great. It's amazing how we have a chance to be here in person <laughs> in these special times, right? So to kick things off, I'm sure you have a lot of uh, conversations with your customers. Can you share what are their top of mind, what are their challenges these days? Um, well, you know, the, there are a lot of things that are, that are kind of driving the conversation in a variety of ways, and it's always different with every customer we've talked to. But in your intro, you talked about digital, digital transformation and sort of transforming the network. That, that comes to us in a lot of different flavors. You know, there's supply chain issues that are kind of forcing customers to think about multi-vendor in new ways. There's the great resignation where people are scared of losing their skills and talent and the single source of truth that exists in the mind of the engineer. All of that is, is uh, a big worry. Um, but really, the, the lead thought is trying to think of ways to make the network contribute to the business instead of being an afterthought that is just an expense to the business. So that, especially with enterprise, is sort of a shift that's happening. That mindset's existed in service provider for quite a while because when a service provider thinks about the network, the network is their product. And so, of course, the network is front of mind in their business thinking. But for enterprise, the network's always been an afterthought, an expense, something that I have to band-aid. Um, but you know, the big shift that seems to be happening, our customers are really starting to think more forward about the network as being a contributor to the business. Yeah, correct. I mean, think, think of everything we do today. We, we utilize the network yes. as, as its foundation. Whether we're talking to, uh, to our family, you know, uh, over geographical distance, or if uh, we're shopping online, yes. or if we're doing a video conference. Um, that's, this is why I, I like this Gardner quote, right? Every business is digitally transforming, and you can't digitally transform if you don't transform your network first. So the net network has become this critical foundation for everything we're doing. Mm -hmm. And when you think of how fast we're going, you know, the, the challenge is, how to scale the network, how to operate the network at scale at the speed of the business and doing it reliably. Yep. Right? Re reliability is key here. You know, there was an ad from the 80s, uh, power is nothing without control. Yeah, and this is living up to the expectations of customers as well. Um, the, the migration to public cloud and hyperscalers has changed the expectation about infrastructure provisioning. Like Correct. you said, it has to move at the speed of the business. People aren't willing to wait anymore for provisioning or firewall changes. Their expectation is they can define their applications, click the button, and then have those applications launch and be ready to, uh, to use. Correct. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, a lot of the activities have gone online, right? From working remotely, shopping, kids taking classes at home. How can IT teams ensure this smooth uh, customer experience? The, um, I mean, Nick touched on one about the, the expectation of, of uh, infrastructure being delivered instantly. That's become the norm for the mm -hmm. application teams. You know, your application teams can click, get their machine, and they're up and running, and their app has a place to live. The network teams haven't quite followed in that same motion, or at least they're, they're oftentimes just playing catch up trying to accommodate that motion or that activity. Um, and, and so what we really want to see our network customers doing is, is thinking about delivering a network as a service or delivering what they offer as mm -hmm. an on-demand service. You know, and if, if they can integrate directly into the tools that those server teams use, all the better. So automation is absolutely the key. But you know, to, to Mansur's point about going fast, just because you can strap mm -hmm. a rocket ship to your car doesn't mean you should. Um, it, you know, so you need to be able to be fast and deliver those services quickly and on demand, but you have to do it right. If you mm -hmm. make a mistake, you've slowed everything down, or even worse, exposed yourself to a security flaw that you may have never seen coming. Mm -hmm. you know, and again, uh, to Scott's point, you can't, you know, security is top of mind for everybody. 
you know, it used to be that, well, you know, we, we, we enter commands manually and then that operator leaves and then the next operator comes in. And it's like, hmm, I wonder why these commands are there. What's, why, why, why is the network configured the way it is? Mm -hmm. You can't have that today. And you, know, you need to know why a network is configured the way it is. You need to know that your network has the right security posture. Otherwise, you're exposing yourself to security vulnerabilities, which can be catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that goes back to the way that we were creating networks before. It was artisanally crafted right. CLI. We were sculpting uh, yes, a creation. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so um, we can't do that anymore because no. it's not uh, like the network and the, ne the infrastructure is not ours to sculpt and control. We are exposing that now through a set of interfaces to our application owners and the, the, the folks who depend on that infrastructure. So if you're going to put power into the hands of the users, there needs to be, like you say, control around what you're exposing and there needs to be um, like an architecture or templates and frameworks that you use to make sure that the correct config gets applied every single time. And is there a way we can do, do a control Z if oopsie sometimes happens? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point. You know, when we talk to network operators and they have PTSD, they call it the like, you know, the pinky PTSD, which is that they <laughs> click on enter and then like the whole network yeah. Freezes. <laughs> well, that's the most terrifying thing that you can hear in any operation center is a space bar followed by three other space bars louder and louder. That means that you have a problem. And so, yeah, rollback is the most important consideration when deploying, um, especially when, uh, when you're uh, handing the control over to, to users and application owners. They need to have a safe and reliable way to roll back to a known good state as well. Yeah, yeah and who doesn't love that? It's like if I make a mistake, I don't have to worry about getting yelled at. I can quickly just fix it before yep. anyone can notice that I, I, that I actually made a mistake. Yeah. That, that's great. It's, it's like in a plane, you have so many layers of operating a plane of, of, of safety, right? Yeah. So like the software needs to ensure at every step that everything you're doing is mm -hmm. reliable. And at the very end, even when you uh, commit all of it, mm -hmm. then you have a way to get out of it, mm -hmm. right? So like this is what you need to think about, having all these layers of safety. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we touched a little bit on security, but with the current geopolitical environment we're living in, um, what are some suggestions for DC teams and security teams? I, you've got to you've got to kind of approach security a little more holistically than we ever did before. I, you know, I can't tell you how many times, and Nick, you've seen this in in Kubernetes deployments and things, where you you have an application environment that's very very dynamic and changing, and since the network team and the security team don't really have the facility to change at the same pace, they'll compromise and they'll say, well, okay, in your little corner over there, we'll just leave that wide open and you can do whatever you want to. Right, right. And maybe you build a perimeter or a little moat around that castle, but if something happens inside that castle, all bets are off. And, and so you've got to approach security in the same way that the, the server teams are deploying it. It's got to be very segmented. It's got to be um, isolating like things from other things that aren't like things, but you've also got to make it, the, it's got to have the ability to change and be dynamic. Mm -hmm. you, you can't let a network engineer just shortcut a security policy by saying, well, okay, well over there I'm going to let them do what they need to do because I can't keep up with what they're doing. You've got to be able to keep up with what they're doing. So infrastructure in the past has always facilitated the app owner, yeah. right? So we try and make as permissive a set of rules as possible so that the application works, but not too permissive such that we let the bad guy in. Right. And I think the issue comes, or the, 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 the friction comes from the interactions between those two teams. Yeah. So one of the best ways to address security is to embed it with the app itself, yep. right? The folks who understand the flows and mechanics of all of those microservices running around the cluster are the application owners mm -hmm. themselves. And so security needs to be another resource defined with the application, just like storage, just like load balancing, just like network segmentation. Security has to be embedded into the application manifests and actioned directly at the point where the application touches the network. And, and one of the biggest things we can do to help facilitate that is to give that network engineer the gift of time. Right? You know, good 
powerful automation that makes their day-to-day -day easier, lets them have a seat, have the time to have a seat at the table with those application owners to make sure that it's designed in from the beginning. So, you know, we, we all talk about automation might eliminate jobs. No, automation is gonna give those engineers the ability to participate and to contribute at the front and not just be putting out fires at, at the end or trying to find that security flaw that was introduced because they didn't do security being at the beginning. being proactive instead yeah. of reactive. Exactly. Right, right. I mean, the only thing I'll add is that you want a, a foundation which, which allows for that level of security. You know, we talk about the single source of truth, you yeah. know, the knowledge of what's in your network, right? The knowledge of why the network is configured the way it is. Um, the ability to react quickly, you know, by deploying the right security policy. Again, you can't do that without having the proper layers of software. The human brain cannot, you know, make up, cannot just uh, uh, have, doesn't have the ability to do it, uh, you know, at the scale that we need to with all of the parameters that one has to take into account. Right. Yeah, but that's wa that's waterfall security that we've been practicing that's in the exactly past, right. which is like we get the app ready, then we get the network ready, then we get the firewalls ready, and then we launch the app. And that works as long as you can execute the whole pipeline every time. But we don't need to run that as a pipeline anymore, right? You can bundle together exactly. the notion of connectivity and security and put that control into the hands of the users if you had a set of tools that, that gives users um, the, the control over firewall policies, applications, at a level that they understand. Correct. Yeah. Now, we have so much activity going on with uh, data centers. Sustainability is another business requirement. So what can modern uh, data centers do uh, in that respect? You know, when, when we think about sustainability, we want, also want to think about like the power consumption of the device that's going in, and that's all very, very important. You know, we're not hardware guys to have that conversation, but what we can do is say, listen, what we can do is allow you to design a more efficient net infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Choose the right hardware for the job. If it's a server that needs to process that packet, use a server to process that packet. If it's a purpose-built piece of network hardware that has 400 gig interfaces, use that device. <coughs> but the experience is going to be consistent, and, and the process to deploy things is going to be consistent across all of those. Absolutely, and yeah. that way teams can lead with innovation instead of being constrained by this, yeah. you know, the logistical stuff. That's right. Yeah, and maybe what I'll, what I'll add is, you know, to me, I, I was always surprised with how many organizations avoid upgrading mm -hmm. their infrastructures because they're worried of yeah causing an outage or causing a disruption. Or they don't so, have a person that knows the CLI. Or they don't know the, <laughs> the person. So they, they're, they're, they're left with these 10-year-old uh, devices, you know, big honking switches, which today can be replaced with like literally one new switches. Every three years, you, you have the devices that deliver the same performance for three times less power and three times less footprint, right? Mm -hmm. So if the, these same softwares that help you automate will help you migrate right from the old to the new and it's that much it, it, it's that much uh, that's that is very helpful to sustainability you know to have the ability to upgrade to the new so i think that that's that's one area the other area that comes to mind is that as data centers are getting more and more distributed uh, flying folks everywhere to go and manage their networks you know can have a big impact on sustainability mm -hmm. rather than having the ability to remotely uh, operate these networks through automation. So you have one single point of control that, from which you can manage you know, the networks that are distributed across many, many different geographical areas. You, know, you can see that having an impact on sustainability as well. Yeah, and and um, that distribution of compute and network is not possible without higher level tools that yep. let you kind of stretch your operational control. Because if I'm moving my data center into 100 small facilities, I can't manage that like 100 small data centers. I have to be able to have a high level interface that reflects the entire state of my footprint and then manage it from that central point. And then, like Scott was saying, let the apps teams decide the best spot to run the workload. Yep, yep. exactly right. So with all these technologies uh, evolving inside the data center realm, what's the next hot thing? What, what excites you about the future and what, what new innovations you think will come or you may be working on? <laughs> what I find exciting is 
the combination of these various technologies that we can leverage to, to improve the life of the operator, right? You know, when we talk about uh, experience first networking, it's about uh, improving the life of the operator and then ultimately giving a better experience to the user, right? And there are uh, so many really cool technologies that we can bring together beyond just our own our, our areas. And you know, there is a lot of work going on at Juniper to kind of bring in these, these solutions together, the best of AI, the best of machine learning, the best of distributed systems, the best of cloud technologies in order to really deliver on, on that mission. Yeah, and I mean, from my perspective, uh, it's really exciting watching uh, the cloud native networking space evolve and mature. And it's uh, really exciting as well to bring some of the, the tools and technologies we've had in traditional networking into the cloud native space to show folks how they can run their brand new applications with you know, the same sets of tools, topologies, and, and security that, they've, uh, that they're used to in private cloud. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think this brings to the end to today's episode. Time always feels short when we're having a good time. Uh, but we can continue the conversation by going to juniper.net slash data center or follow us on Twitter. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.